response button. And then I'm going to press this back in and draw it back. Hello, this is Bob Thorne. This is a continuation of the talk, an interview with Julian. You can take the piece of paper down now. Julian, thank you. Uh, this is a continuation of the March 21st, second part of the interview with Julian Heichlin, who's a judicial activist, former Penn State physical chemistry professor, dealing with the fully in formed jury movement and a variety of other issues dealing with the courts in the United States. Okay, so where did we leave off? What would you like to discuss now? Uh, well, there's one thing that I think should be mentioned is that um, the idea that the jury has the right to judge the law as well as the facts is uh, there's, uh, this is a requirement in 24 of the state constitutions uh, that state that the jury has the right to judge the law as well as the facts, or shall judge the law as well as the facts. Um, and the U.S. Constitution does not discuss the duties of the jury, so therefore it's the state laws uh, which uh, prevail. And the other thing is this idea of judging the law as well as the facts is not just limited to the jury. Uh, the Congress can always repeal a law. The uh, U.S. Attorney's Office doesn't have to enforce a law. In fact, most of the crimes they get, they don't enforce uh, because uh, they just don't have the, the manpower to do it so that they pick and choose which cases they want to choose. The judge could always dismiss a case in the interest of justice, which has happened to me several times, that judges have just dismissed the cases against me. Um, <clears throat> If a police officer stops you for a traffic violation in the street, he can either give you a ticket or he can give you a warning. If he gives you a warning, he's nullified the law. So that this is not an unusual concept and it's been throughout our history for a long, long time. Uh, and of course the juries have the same rights. And in fact, many of the most important freedoms we got came because it was the jury that forced them on the system. And the original one actually happened in Great Britain. It was uh, William Penn and uh, another fellow, I can't think of his name now, who uh, were Unitarians. And they practiced their Unitarianism out in the, uh, not Unitarians, they were Quakers, I'm sorry, they were Quakers. And they practiced their Quakerism in public and it was against the law for anybody to do, follow any religion except the Church of England. That was the official religion. They went to a uh, trial and uh, the judge instructed the jury to hold the law. There was no question about the facts and the jury refused to convict. They came in with a not guilty uh, uh, result and the judge locked the jurors up without food and water for three days until finally some higher court ordered the jury released and there were particularly two jurors, uh, but the jury refused to change its mind. Uh, as a result, William Penn left England, came to the United States and founded the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which is one of the two of the original colonies which had freedom of religion. The other one being Rhode Island, where Roger Williams was a Unitarian and ran into similar difficulties with the official churches, and Rhode Island was also a state where there was freedom of religion. The other colonies did not have freedom of religion that came later on. Um, the interesting thing about Rhode Island is, in fact, the, the first Jewish congregation in the United States was in Rhode Island. Newport, mm, Rhode I Island. Heard that actually, yeah. New, yeah, Newport. The church is still there. Mm. and. Uh, Functions. Yeah, Newport. I mean, the church, the synagogue is still there. Yeah, Newport's where the International Tennis Hall of Fame is. <laughs> okay. So. And so this is how we got freedom of religion. Uh -huh. It wasn't some uh, legislature or king or somebody that decided this would be a good idea. This was the common people stuffing it down the throats of the government. Uh -huh. The first case that actually happened on the continental United States was again while we were still colonies before the uh, uh, the revolution and it was a case of Peter Zenger who published a newspaper 
in New York and he criticized the king. That was a crime to criticize the king and he was tried and again the uh, lawyer, uh, there were two lawyers actually, one named Andrew and one named Hamilton and in fact there's some confusion many people refer to it as, I mean one named Alexander and one named Hamilton, many people refer to it as uh, Alexander Hamilton was the lawyer, but of course he wasn't. He wasn't born yet at the time of this trial. Uh, there were two judge, two lawyers that helped it, one whose last name was Alexander and one whose last name was uh, Hamilton. Um, and uh, the jury found him not guilty and that's how we got freedom of the press. Most of these freedoms we have weren't given willingly by the government. They were always forced down their throats. Mm -hmm. And it's the juries who were in The juries were the major force responsible for getting these things changed because That's they right. would win the laws. They would win the cases and that was they would, precedent. They, and that was the precedent. That's why Thomas Jefferson said, uh, it is only the jury that I have any hope that the country will remain a free country. It's not right. It was Thomas Jefferson. He's, uh, he was a pretty brilliant guy. He was a smart guy. He was really smart. Yeah, it was, it was a little history series, history channel series on the founding fathers of the Constitution, and I bought that little set at a uh, BJ's wholesale. I think the whole 20 hours of that history channel, the founding fathers, was $29, and it's two DVDs on each little thing, and it's pretty good deal. And they've got a really interesting history of all these people from MIT and Harvard, all these professors commenting on the things. And it's done in a movie way also. It's very interesting. So now the juries. What could the juries do nowadays in terms of getting to change the law? So it's the juries. The juries people... never change the law okay. directly. That's it's not, got to be indirectly. It's not, not, it's not their power. Through. It's just if they stop convicting, they the, stop law, convicting the law. The law Sometimes it's never even taken off the books. There are lots of laws that are still on the books that okay. aren't enforced. So in the jury's but probably in contraception is probably illegal yeah, in illegal some states. Laws, yeah. uh, it was enforced in Massachusetts and Connecticut when I was a boy. Uh -huh. You couldn't buy contraceptives in those uh -huh. two states. When I was a boy, I didn't need them, okay. so it didn't affect me personally. But and those laws probably are still on still the books. On books but nobody there are paid. states I know where it's illegal to pitch your horse to a fire hydrant or something like that. Yeah, these are blue laws, yeah. Well, that's not blue laws. It was where, those are parking laws. Parking laws, okay. Uh, I don't haven't seen that case come up much lately. <laughs> yeah, not too much. Like but many of those laws, are gambling laws in particular, are yeah. out. And I know of one particular in State College, Pennsylvania, where Penn State is, where in fact um, there was obscenity laws and uh, the district attorney arrested the owner of the adult bookstore for distributing some stuff which was considered obscene and he said I had an ironclad case against this guy but the jury found him not guilty okay. and he said I will never try another obscenity case again as long as I'm the district attorney and he never did. So that's just another case of a law existing on the books and the jurors realizing the law is an ass. Is they know. They describe it and they just they, they have, we disregard all the judges. They found this guy guilty in this one case and the district attorney made the decision that he would never try another. And a lot of the gambling laws vanish like that. Many of them are still on the books. Yeah. So with people, when they see them, some person who's had a little cocaine at a party and they're going to sentence this guy to jail for a long time, the jury, here's all the instructions. For Remember the, the mayor of Washington, D.C.? What was it? Barry. Name? Barry. Barry, yeah. He but, had, yeah. He had, was caught with a lot of cocaine. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Barry and Barry. Yeah. Mary and Barry. And they had a good case against him, but mm -hmm. he was a very well liked mm -hmm. thing. And there were, of course, in Washington, D.C., there were black jurors. And the thing. So they just voted him not guilty? They just voted him not guilty. <laughs> even though, I mean, he was guilty as hell, but they. Yeah. They didn't want him to go to jail. Yeah. 
So basically, with a lot of people who are young people who get caught with a little bit of cocaine or a little marijuana, instead of seeing them railroaded in jail for like 20 years or something absurd, the jury just listens to the judges. You must sentence according to my rules. And the guy was caught using this, and they, the jury said, "Yeah, no, he was caught." The, so you must sentence. The jury just says, "No, we're not going to listen. To you. We're just going to disobey you." The judges, nullify. the judges sometimes do it too. I would used to smoke marijuana in public and announce it on a bullhorn when I was in state college and I was arrested six times for this and finally the last two cases came up and the judge just dismissed them in the interest of justice. It's said that the best way to get rid of an unjust law is for everybody to just violate it, make it unenforceable. Though everybody is doing that now with marijuana but they're still enforcing it left and right. I mean 50 million people use this country. So they get a lot of money out of these people basically with fines and they're getting people into jail for briefly. They do that. It gives, it gives the police something to do. It keeps the prison yeah. something to do. So that there's, I think, but that's not really the reason. It's the question is there is a part of the population who should know better, who thinks this thing is terrible and the propaganda applies. Now some of these drugs really are terrible, but in fact, I mean, if you're really sick and in pain near the end, they give you morphine, yeah. which is one of the worst drugs there is, but it relieves your pain, and when somebody's going to die in a few months, you're not worried about how it's going to affect yeah, their personality. See, uh, what, one of the reasons they don't want some of the illegal drugs, like the heroin, is there's a supposed legitimate pharmaceutical thing. you got these drug drug mafia, and it's making a lot of money off of a lot of these drugs that are supposed to the legitimate type, the morphine, uh, whereas heroin's probably better. It's got it's acetyl morphine, diacetyl okay. morphine, so across the blood-brain barrier, it's the, actually morphine. Those drugs morphine. really have side effects, and they are in some ways responsible for crime. Heroin, not the way people think. They say, well, the guy's under heroin, he's dangerous as hell. If the guy's it's under the heroin, he's not dangerous yeah. at all. The it's when, he, it's when he's sober that he's dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all the illegal milieu that he's forced to work in when it's illegal. But That's what marijuana it. is the specific case mm -hmm. where this drug is not only harmless, it's one of the best medicines ever known. Mm -hmm. When it was going to be outlawed in the 1930s, it was the American Medical Association that fought uh, getting it because it was a standard medical drug. And in the 1930s, they didn't have many drugs. So the Medical Association was much against making it illegal. But in any event, uh, you take when Califano was a Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, he uh, said that well, marijuana has got to be banned because it's the gateway drug to cocaine. That ninety-nine percent of cocaine users start with marijuana. So I'm out on the streets smoking my marijuana with a bullhorn, and I say, you know, he's wrong. The real gateway drug to cocaine is milk, because a hundred percent of cocaine users started with milk. <laughs> And milk is a dangerous substance. There are people who are lactose intolerant, lactate intolerant. Milk should at least be a controlled substance. And worse than that, it's as addictive as can be to little babies. You take the milk away from little babies and they die. And I advocate that any woman that breastfeeds her baby should have her breasts cut off. I'm screaming this on a bullhorn in downtown State College. Uh -huh. Afterwards, a guy comes up to me and he says, look, he says, everybody doesn't uh, drink milk. He says, I don't drink milk. I say, do you use cocaine? He says, no. I say, see, that proves it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it didn't lead to one, didn't lead to But I mean, you see, it's that sort of ridiculous thing. You talk to people around here, they think marijuana is marijuana. If they don't use it, they don't use it, particularly with the older people. The younger people are now using it more, but you know, Oh, it's terrible, it's a gateway drug, it does this, and that, and that. I mean, there's just, and I got to admit, I was that way until my wife, my wife straightened me out. Yeah. <laughs> people don't realize, most people don't realize the kind of brainwashing apparatus that is really our news media and how sophisticated the mind control and the brainwashing are. It was this... KGB agent that defected, his name was Yuri Bezmenov, B-E-Z-M-E-N-O-V, and he was interviewed by G. Edward Griffin, who's a very... Oh, yeah, he's the guy, I'm writing his book. Yeah. He's the guy with the, the the Federal Reserve, he's fighting the Federal Reserve. G. Edward Griffin is fighting everything that's wrong. He's a real good guy. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I've actually heard him speak. I've met him. You met him? Yeah. Because yeah, that Yuri Bezmenov interview. But people, In fact, I think, not only did I meet him, I ran a radio program, I think I interviewed him. With Jerry Griffin. Yeah. yeah. Well, with Yuri Bezmenov, 
he, his father was a high-ranking Soviet military officer, and he was chosen to go and work in the KGB. And some of his initial assignments were in India, actually, where he was <laughs> working in the ashram of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And he said the goal of that was that the KGB wanted um, him to find what he called, and what the KGB called, useful idiots. Mia Farrow, Walter Mondale, all those people like that, and sort of strike up a little bit of a rapport with them, and then do whatever they could to get them to become participants in the indoctrination of things like the Lavrenti Beria School of Psychopolitics and everything like that. And there was a picture somewhere along the line where they did show some of these political figures, you know, with pictures taken, and they were presumably at the Lavrenti Beria School, but these people were indoctrinated into that thing, and then they're released back on the United States. And this is part of the reason we've got, you know, so much communism and so much of this mind control and New World Order communism is what it is, one world government controlling this country. And the people are very brainwashed by our news media. Most of it's lies. Um, they're very, very sophisticated in how they do this. They know how people's minds work, and like Adolf Hitler said, uh, the bigger the lie, the more people believe it. So what the other thing they'll do is they'll have it be all the major news media that will say the big lie again, and people well, don't believe that they can control it's, it's all e of our news media. It's even simpler than that. The individuals do it to themselves. It's the question of reasoning. I know a guy, I first became aware of this, a guy who was the dean of engineering at the University of Minnesota while I was there, and he was put on a panel to see what the... Uh, whether the speed limit should be reduced because a lot of people were being killed in automobile accidents and speed is a killer. Yeah. And I went to the panel, I says, well, we got to decide how much we should reduce the speed limit. He says, mm -hmm. you're not asking the right question. Maybe we should increase the speed limit and kill more people. Hmm. <gasps> Everybody was shocked. But he says, look, if you really don't want to kill people with an automobile, just turn the speed limit down to zero miles per hour. He says, the point is, you're always willing to sacrifice a number of deaths for convenience. Maybe we should make the speed limit 80 miles per hour and kill another 20,000 people a year. There's nothing magic about 60 miles per hour. He says, it's always a cost-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. You decide what the cost is and what the benefit is. Mm -hmm. He says, and I had a similar situation. I was at Penn State University and they were often riots there for one reason or another. Um, they always were either because of some athletic event, either they won or lose, it didn't make any difference. There was a riot afterwards regardless. Uh, and the other, of course, had to do with drugs. And this is being discussed at the city council and I'm sitting next to the chief of police. Incidentally, I became quite friendly with the chief of police and the district attorney as a result of all my arrests. So anyway, I'm sitting next to the police chief and they're talking about how can they cut down the riots and they're all this bullshit everybody is talking about and finally I said to the chief police, I said, you know, it's very simple if you don't want any riots. All you have to do is outlaw athletic events mm -hmm. and insist that the bars stay open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't close them all at two o'clock in the morning and throw all the drunks into the street. What do you think is going to happen? I said, the point is to keep the drunks inside the bars. I says, if you do those two things, there'll never be a riot here again, probably. He looked exactly. at me a minute and he says, maybe he says, he says, I don't think I can sell it. <laughs> but you see, of course, it's because nobody uses reason. I had one of the uh, fellows that worked with um, that told me, he says, there's two kinds of people, those that can do cost-benefit analysis and those that can't. And most of them can't. Okay, two kinds of people that can do that. Yeah. Well, getting back to Yuri Mesmanov, one of the things he talked about was the demoralization of a country. And the word demoralization to most people, this was the psychopolitics that was being done on the United States. Um, to most people, demoralization would mean they were totally demoralized, out of it, just apathetic and everything like that. But what the real meaning of the word demoralization that he talked about was a form of mind control that made it that, you know, this would apply in one way and then that would apply in another, and the people would just see all the contradictions and they couldn't make heads or tails out of anything. It made it very confusing so that the people were just unable to see the truth clearly about anything, even when it was obvious. Now, 
this has become apparent to, I think, many people in the United States. They are having all of these people, they themselves know the truth about the Kennedy assassination, that we've been lied to. They know the truth about TWA flight 800, they've been lied to. They know the truth about 9-11, they've been lied to. They know the truth about AIDS, that it was a bioweapon, it was a genocide program, we've been lied to. But the frustration they feel with so many people who just can't see the most obvious truths, those people are actually in that particular predicament because their minds were somehow susceptible to this demoralization, mind control, that made them unable to be able to distinguish what was the truth and what was not the truth. And a lot of it has to do with changing of words and the meaning of word means, like liberal, the thing liberal. You know, back in the time of Thomas Jefferson, liberal meant somebody who was a libertarian type of person. Then the word liberal in the 1960s comes to mean somebody who's a left-wing guy. So there's this all these artificial things that never made any sense to me when I was in seventh grade. What's liberal, what's left-wing or anything like that? But that's part of the deliberate confusion and then having it mean two different things. It takes all these people that can't make heads or tails out of things. Let me tell you, I think a lot of it is government always wants control. Yeah. And look at the example we have in this country. It was a result of 9-11. We then instituted um, scanners at airports. TSA. I mean, okay. TSA. We formed TSA and just scanners. And it probably made some sense at the time. Uh, but you see, it's now been 11 years, and there hasn't been another airplane incident that's originated from the United States. Why was it necessary last year for them to put in these super scanners? Yeah. We had no problem. Mm -hmm. This was done strictly as a means of control. And let me tell you what's going to happen. Sooner or later, there will be some sort of a train accident, either, either purposely yeah, or, or accidentally, and then you will have to go through TSA scanner to get on trains. Mm -hmm. And it won't stop at trains. Then there's buses. Mm -hmm. You'll have to go through these to go through buses. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you'll have to go through the same thing to get into automobiles yeah. sooner or later. And then motorcycles. Yeah. And then if you take a walk. Yeah. I mean, you see, you couldn't do that immediately, but you will slowly and sooner or later some incident comes along which allows the government to exert more yeah, control. Us, more control. This more control. It's just that simple. It's, it's about controlling us. And there's the thing that it looks, it talks about in the Old Testament. It was about freedom, you know, breaking way free from Pharaoh. So, you know, the book of Exodus and all those things were about breaking free and getting freedom. That's what it was a book. I mean, the book, the Ten, or the movie, The Ten Commandments, Cecil DeMille talked about this being about freedom. That was a very good movie with Charlton Heston, The Ten Commandments. And freedom is one of the most important things, and this force that's opposite to freedom wants to restrict us and everything like that. Because when we basically are without freedoms, we die. We get very sick and frustrated and we die. And this element that's trying to restrict the freedoms is an extremely evil thing. It's something that's opposite of God. Well, it's, it's government by its very nature of what it does. The always thing is, let's take the case of my case where I'm passing out pamphlets in front of the court in New York. My public defender, who is my uh, standby counsel, describes me as a shabby old man with pathetic pamphlets. That's okay. the way I've been described in the New York Times as a result of her, which is probably an accurate description. Okay. But there I am passing out pamphlets to people in front of the New York District Court. I've been there 14 times. My guess is I've passed out 400 pamphlets. Okay. 90% of those go directly into the garbage. Okay. So there may be 30 or 40 people that have seen Three. these okay. uh, and looked at them. And maybe two or three have actually been called up for jury duty. Okay. All the judge has to do is say, have you seen this pamphlet that he passed out? They say yes, he can say you're dismissed yeah. if they don't want it. Yeah. Okay. But you see, that's not the issue. Okay. The issue is control. Yeah. Okay, really the issue was control. Yeah. So what did they do? They arrested me, they're charging me for jury tampering, and they've defeated themselves. It became a major story in the New York Times, three times over them. It's all over the country. You're interviewing me now because of this. This has become now a major issue in the United States, and the judges brought it on themselves. 
that's of course the 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 thing. But of course, I did it because I knew it would happen. I knew they couldn't stand it. All they had to do was leave me alone, but I knew they wouldn't. They're just. It's not that they're not that smart. It's just against their human nature that they don't. They couldn't leave you alone. They couldn't they felt leave they had you. control yeah. of you. They so they made an able issue. Uh, not only that, they've now got themselves into this terrible thing. They've ch ch charged me with jury tampering. But of course, this is a case that's hopeless for them to win. Their two arguments was is that it's uh, well, their first argument was it's against the law for the jury to judge the law as well as the fact, until I pointed out that it's constitutionally required in 24 states, including New York. Well, then they said, well, all right, it's legal, but the jury's not supposed to know about it. And they said the way to do that is you, it's um, illegal to uh, distribute it except in a public forum, and the plaza in front of the court is not a public forum. Their Supreme Court decisions, which says it is, and they weren't talking about the district court, they were talking about the Supreme Court of the United States, where somebody was passing it out in front, and the courts stopped the police from enforcing it. But of course, a public plaza, one of the things, sidewalks are public, I mean, are public uh, forums. And it just so happens for the New York court, which is not true of most courts, is that the plaza is the sidewalk between Center Street and Pearl Street. So that in fact it's a sidewalk, which means it's automatically a public forum. So they can't win this case. On the other hand, they can't dismiss it either, because that would be an admission that all the judges have been committing perjury. Okay. So they've got themselves into this impossible box. Okay. They can't win and they can't give up. Okay. All right. And they brought it all on themselves. Yeah. I am a shabby old man with some pathetic pamphlets. I mean, it's an accurate description, but I knew they couldn't stand it, and sooner or later they broke. They broke, okay. If you... All of this thing, this whole big hubbub now, they brought it on themselves. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You, did, you enjoyed doing it a lot, didn't you? I loved it. You know something? I loved it. <laughs> I feel the same way about 9-11 Truth, which is why I bought this camera and going to the 9-11 Truth meetings. I felt the same way about getting interviewed about TWA Flight 800 and all the lying I've dealt with. And I'm just so fed up with it. I want to fix them in every way. I think people who have had things happen to them, they just really are angry at the government. They ought to take up this fighting attitude and just get real pleasure in defeating these evil people at every step along the way because they really are going to do a lot more evil if they're allowed to get away with well, it. Well, the it's things the that I do is... I mean, I know a lot of people, whether in, I guess it's called the truther movement about 9-11 and mm -hmm. whatnot. Yeah. And I think there's a, f a fair amount of evidence to support a lot of evidence. Th that case, a lot of evidence. And I've heard of it. My reason I don't get interested particularly is, let's assume we assume it's all true. I don't see that it's going to change. I like to take issues where I can make change. For example, if I can get the courts to start obeying the law or get them to stop arresting people who are using drugs. So these are the issues that are more interest to me because I feel that solving them will solve problems. Well, you're not going to undo 9-11. Yeah, but I think 9-11... There is something truth be to exposing it so that the truth comes out, but you're not you're not going to change it. Well, you might prevent I future such situations. My own public opinion is that 9-11 is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. And after 9 well, Unfortunately, we may be the camels. I don't know about that. <laughs> I think that what we're going to have is in Washington, D.C., we're going to have our Nuremberg trials. I think we need to have our Nuremberg trials in Washington, D.C. That's what I'm advocating yeah. for the judges. Yeah, That's for the judges. Well, I think that it needs uh -huh. to be for the Nuremberg trials in Washington, D.C. We could call it the Washington trials. I think it needs to bring out the truth about everything from the Kennedy assassination, the Martin Luther King assassination, 9 11, and these two wars based on lies. It, it's hard to try those things that are in the past now. The people mm, who are involved, so the people who are involved directly are probably all dead now. Mm, no, they're not. <laughs> well, it's not who we've been told did it. What happened? There were bombs in the buildings that were blown. Oh, you're, you're talking about 9-11. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the Kennedy assassination. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Kennedy assassination. Kennedy assassination. Any of the people who are involved are, 
are gone. I yeah, mean, they, they got many of these people were very anxious to give deathbed confessions, like I believe it was E. Howard Hunt that was telling about how he was involved, one of the people. And, I mean, I remember Fletcher Prouty, Colonel Fletcher Prouty, talking about that, the pictures, the hobos being behind there. One of the guys looked at, one of the generals in the Pentagon looked at him and said, that's General Ed Lonsdale. He was the CIA black operations guy responsible for the coups of Mag Sai Sai in the Philippines, Diem Brothers in Vietnam, you know, Mossadegh in Iran, and Kennedy in Dealey Plaza. He was a bad guy. But the situation is, I think that um, we need the truth to come out about these things for once and for all in our equivalent of the Nuremberg trials, the Washington D trials. And I think what we need is we need a whole bunch of people sentenced very severely for... I, I can tell you another thing about 9-11. Yeah, we Even can't do that for the things that are as far back as the Kennedy thing, because they're, they're all gone. Yeah, I know. I mean, I mean that was, was what, 50 years yeah, ago know, yeah, when he was assassinated. Yeah, but just getting the truth out is having a good purpose otherwise. Another thing is this. I saw a lady, and we've all been told it was 3,000 people that died on 9-11. I saw a young lady, paralegal, in this West Orange office I was working in in August of 2004. She was a paralegal working for one of the big law firms in New York City that was dealing with 9-11 victims' families. And there were multiple law firms doing with that. She says they all know, all the law firms and all the families know it wasn't 3,000 people, 11,000 people that died on 9 /11. Well, certainly, who, there were 3,000 people that died immediately. But there are many, like my next door neighbor, who didn't die for three or four years. Yeah. That was the result of it. And of course, that happened with many of the people who were doing the rescue work, the fire yeah, department and the police yeah. department. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't die in the incident. I know. But they died as a result of the yeah. incident. But they were also a deliberate underreporting of the total number who died on the day of 9-11. And there were also a number of people from South America and everything like oh, that. Oh, they were from all over the world. They were from all over the world. Yeah, I mean, you know. But the family yeah. members knew that they couldn't get in touch with anymore, so they were I added mean, to the, the, the lists of the lawyers sure, okay. dealing with 9-11 victims' families. But certainly them. the total number of people that died as a result of that is certainly much higher than much 3,000. But even a lot more died right after because a lot of people were not, you know, on the on books, they were people from South America, people from... And the, they, they didn't probably, find their bodies in many cases. They didn't find their bodies, and the family members just knew they weren't getting the call through to them anymore, and they knew that they had been working in the World Trade Center, and they died. But she told me it was 11,000 people, and all the law firm right. and all the families. This one of the thing is this... Um, oh, yeah, this is what I think. I think it ought to be a law, a federal law, that given what happened, how the judge suppressed the truth, truth in the trial of the movie, the JFK, JFK how that judge suppressed the truth and didn't allow Kevin Costner or Garrison to present the truth about the all alias of Clay Shaw that was the key to the whole thing instead of it being Lee Harvey Oswald that would have been traced all the way up to who really was responsible for it. Um, I think that all judges, there, first of all, there ought to be independent video recording of all trials because we know that what they do in the recording, they're just going to edit out what they don't want and is not convenient for them. There needs to be a permanent record of it done by citizens, not the federal government, because they will alter the tape. Well, they the, need to be independent. The news media, when well, well, usually, yeah, the news media, usually they're, they're forbidden. They're part of they're part of the whole thing, but not 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 all of them. No, there are always there people are who are whistleblowers. News. There are I mean, some honest news media, yeah, and they well, lose their jobs. It's not they, the question even so much of being honest. They see they got a good story, they want to sell it and make some money yeah. out of it. Well, it's only co it's a coincidence that it happens to be honest. Yeah. Talking about the... <laughs> but that's how people function. Talking about the book, honest, or about honest news people and everything like that, and honesty in the news media, there was a book entitled Into the Buzzsaw, Leading Journalist Exposed the Myth of a Free Press. It was edited by Christina Borgesson. Uh, she was the Emmy Award winning, I believe it was, reporter for CBS. And she was very good, so she got the Emmy Award, and then she was given the assignment to go out and get the truth about TWA Flight 800, which she did. <laughs> and the next thing is she was fired from CBS for getting the truth about it. And it was supposedly, according to various sources, Calstrom, the FBI director in charge of the Flight 800 investigation for that area of New York, that put the pressure on CBS to have her fired. And she said the whole process where you weren't getting any justice and you were being lied about and lied to and everything was just a big lie. She said like it felt like it was going into a buzzsaw. So she entitled the book, uh, Into the Buzzsaw, Leading Journalists Exposed the Myth of a Free Press. And there are about 30-something chapters in that book. And most of the chapters are written by really good reporters who also got fired for telling the truth when they were working for the mainstream news media. Some of them were just independent, but a lot of them were 
you know, working for the mainstream news media, then got fired. They find out that all this business about freedom of the press goes out the window. There's also, well, so I think what it ought to be also, is in addition to the judges, there being independent video recording of the, the trials going on, so there'd be a permanent record of what the truth well, is. Who, does, not the, able to be who does the recording? It could be U.S. people who were designated to go in there, and then they would have witnesses with them to make sure they were not falsifying the trials. Well... It would have to be independent okay. people and a permanent record made of it, but you can't rely on the federal government and the news media to do because they'll lie and they'll suppress the truth. There needs to be full documentation of what goes on at those trials so that people who lie, like the judge responsible for suppressing the truth about Kennedy's assassination, need to be held accountable later by the proof of those videos about how he suppressed the truth. And what I also believe is this. All judges need to get up in front of that same video camera and they need to take an oath, just like the jurors all take an oath. The judge needs to take an oath. I, judge so-and-so, promise to allow the truth, the whole truth, and the nothing but the truth to come out in my court of law, in this federal court. And if I don't, I am subject to the following penalties. And he reads off all the penalties. He'll go to jail for the next 40 years. He'll have his law license. They'll be disbarred and everything like that. You he know, needs to read that if he's caught they in false take, They take that oath to uphold the Constitution, and it's a serious crime yeah. if they don't. But, well, they keep on getting away with it. But they all do it. Yeah, they all do it. They lie. Because then, you can't sue them. Yeah, well, the thing is, there needs to be a change in that rule. You can't sue them. I'm aware of some of that. But what they need to do is they need to have the documentation by video cameras, the independent sources, to show at a later time how the judge suppressed the truth and how they were lying, and they need to be held accountable for that. Look, the court rules are written in the book by put down by the Supreme Court. Yeah. That the judge must instruct the jury that it must uphold the law as he gives it to them. But what's the now, Constitution say? The Constitution, the Constitution says the jury must judge the law as well as the facts. Yeah. Well, the judges need to be accountable. And held accountable. But they're not. They I know all, they're not. They, that's they, all, they all know they're lying. I know, but they've got, that's got to be I mean, changed. if How they didn't that? know before I started this, they certainly know it now. Yeah, okay. Well, the thing is, they're not accountable now. How do we make the judges accountable that if they get caught lying, they go to jail citizen, like everybody Citizen else. tribunals. Citizen tribunals. That's and the situation I mean. is there needs to be documentation of what's going on in those trials and where they're suppressing the truth. And the jurors need to be able to bring questions up. And nobody can alter those videotapes. They need to be kept in a repository where people can't alter them. Uh, and then they can be brought out at a later time when necessary to show how the judge It's clear lie. to me that the jurors should be interfering with the case. But well, well, there needs to be video recording of it. And if the jurors sense the judge is lying or suppressing evidence, they need to be able to ask questions to the judge. You're lying here. They don't even have to get them to the If they have any reasonable doubt that they've gotten the thing right, they can just they're obligated to obligated not, obligated by, find no, that guilty. Okay, so what that's good, it's good that they can let a guy off and he's they're not found obligated. guilty. But they don't get the judge in a jail and disbarred, which is no. what they need to do for a judge lying. Need there to get wouldn't the be, judges. There wouldn't be any judges left. I know. That's why we would be better <laughs> off. What it would be is initially there wouldn't be any judges. And then what they would have to do is they would have to find some honest people to replace all of these judges who are in jail. Look, and every kid know. that goes to law school is an honest, decent kid. Yeah. Maybe not 100%, but you know, they are. The system corrupts them. And they go there and... They take an oath to uphold the Constitution yeah. and love land. And what happens when they get out? They earn their living by finding ways to avoid following the law. Yeah, this is the nature of their business. Process. I mean, so that in the end, they're completely corrupted because if That's they don't find a, if they don't find a way around the law, you they wouldn't need them. Me. You wouldn't need them. Yeah. So yeah. that it's one of those occupations that they're screwed. I mean, I know kids that I grew up with, went to college with, they were going to save the world, they're going to be lawyers, yeah. they're going to do this and that. They start out idealistic. I mean, we knew one was a very good uh, girl, uh, a woman who was a friend of my wife's, very close friend, and so mm -hmm. it's, boy, she was gung-ho to go to law school and she was going to be a yeah, public defender. Problem. She was going to be a public defender and yeah. save all the people yeah, that yeah. are wrong. And she wound up being a collection agent for one of the hospitals for people who didn't pay their bills. Yeah. That's where the money was. Yeah, that's where it forces You don't get any money by defending poor, indigent... Well, the <laughs> legal aid lawyers do, some of them, and they don't make an awful lot, but some they of them don't set the precedent for... Money. I understand. And they usually don't stay legal aid lawyers for long. This is how they start. If they do movies on it, they do. They can. They, <laughs> they, most of them, this is they many start that way, but then they go off into something that's... 
Well, my, 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 some of the, the nature, the, it, it's the nature of the business, which is corrupting. Yeah, I agree. But it doesn't mean that it's not solvable, this corruption. When all the problems with it that lead up to that are identified, they can be changed by people saying, we're not putting up with this anymore, and we need to do this and this and this to correct Let's it. Let's assume you're guilty. You want to hire a lawyer who's going to tell the truth? Uh, if you are guilty, no. well, I mean, some people... You're charged with some crime, you know you've committed it. Yeah, it you're entitled to a defense. You want your lawyer to go in and say, well, he confessed to me, judge, I know he's guilty. Yeah, okay. Well, you don't want to hire that guy. Yeah, well, some people don't. I, I would say, though, that some people who've done something bad, they need to have the mitigating circumstances explained, and then they need to see why the, the laws are... They want to get off. Yeah, most of them do, I would say that. But the now look at the other end from the district attorney's office. Yeah. A lot of them got to get elected. Yeah. They don't get elected by losing cases. Yeah, right, that's true. And they don't get promoted by yeah. losing cases. And this is a terrible thing about the okay? courts. Okay, yeah. but that's not the courts, that's the people. Yeah. The people want the district attorney to convict everybody and this put is, them in prison. This is, this is, big this is our problem. You know, this is big. I mean, they're just the manifestation of it. Yeah. You know, you can't put all the blame on them this is the way we want them to operate. Now, not necessarily with the defense lawyers, but certainly with the prosecution lawyers, you can't get prosecution. And in fact, it even goes to the judges where they're elected in states. states. They, if they don't get convictions, yeah. well, this that is people what... want, the people don't want to reelect them because the assumption is that somebody's guilty. When a guy it. goes into court in his prison uniform with his handcuffs, justice was done. And there's six police officers who are uh, uh, testifying against him. Often they're lying through their teeth, yeah. but that doesn't make any difference. The guy is guilty the minute he walks into yeah. court in the public spine. It's set up I don't know if you've been familiar with this Anthony, whatever the trial was in Orlando, the famous one where she. Uh, supposedly murdered her baby and maybe actually did. Mm, well, it was TV. was qu quite well uh, publicized all, all over the country. Um, something Casey Anthony or something like that, I think was her name. And everybody I talked to thought was sure she was guilty. They wanted her guilty. The jury found her not guilty based on reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any evidence. They didn't find the uh, they didn't find the baby, I don't think, or whatever, whatever it was. And I know the people that I talked to were just furious at the jury. Yeah. I mean, that jury needed police protection when it walked out of that oh, court. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things you mentioned... And, and maybe she, she... Let's assume she was guilty. Yeah. But, but if they didn't find they the didn't, body, how could they know? Well, they didn't prove their case. Yeah. It was clear, if you look at the thing is, they didn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Because they didn't have a body. Well, there was a lot of things they didn't have, I mean, in there. One of the things that the jury, the district attorneys, are given a promotion on the basis of how many people and guilty people they Oh, yeah. Get. That's ridiculous. It ought to be on whether they well, did but it. But right how do you think not. police get promotions? Yeah, by that stuff. It's I wrong. mean, they have to give so many tickets a day. Yeah. Every time they make an arrest or catch somebody, yeah. that's good for it's their record. It's all I mean, scam. they're not paying policemen to walk around the street and steal vegetables off the vegetable vendor, so which is what they would otherwise be doing. It's the money power that's collecting the money from all the tickets, whether they're given out right or wrong, that's basically forcing the police to let's, do Let's not even put it at that. There, of course, there's some truth to that. But let's not even put it at level. Is if a policeman spends a month and he's never given a ticket, you begin to wonder, is this guy really doing his job? Yeah. Well, I mean... If, you, if he doesn't put out enough tickets, yeah, well, that's what they might then, think. Well, the not only they, they might think, criminals. it's not a question of what they might think. Yeah. What other way do they have to judge? Well, maybe if the people would see that he's caught some really dangerous people who committed murders and his, uh, his colleagues then, were then, getting then, people who then, had minor little traffic. Then they get, right, then they do well. But of course, everybody, then most policemen are probably traffic cops. Yeah, that's what they get all the money. <laughs> I mean, I remember... Well, you, but the point is... And if the guy never comes in with a violation, wouldn't it be normal for his boss to wonder what the hell is this guy doing? I mean, he's been out there a month, he didn't find anybody breaking the law. And maybe he did find a lot of people breaking the law, but he didn't think it was important. He gave them warnings, say, which he's entitled to do. Yeah, I would say that there's an acceptable number of 
people you get for traffic violations, for running red lights and things like that. If you meet that number, then anybody who the police department would know that that's about a reasonable number. The point is that number is always picked from some sort of average. Mm -hmm. And the guys that are aggressive and give out a lot of one keep raising the yeah, average. They keep on getting more money. Now, one of the situations is... They happen to get more money, but I think that it's the fundamental question of human nature. Because after all, the police chief who's going to make the promotions, he isn't personally getting the money. I mean, the money goes into the, the coffers. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but if his guys aren't arresting people, why do we need them? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I mean let's assume all the citizens obeyed all the laws. You wouldn't need a police department. Yeah. So if you're not arresting people and putting them in, we're there, well, we ought to cut down the police force. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, that would be a reduction. I mean, yeah. okay. Yeah. So. It's against human nature not to be doing it. I mean, it's not that these are necessarily evil people. Yeah. This is the question of why people function. Yeah. If you're a police officer, you're supposed to arrest people. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's if you're a district think. attorney, you're supposed to convict well, people. And a lot of times, and a lot of times, done something a lot wrong. of times, district attorneys hide evidence that would be favorable to the. And yeah, they do that. Yeah, they they can be held accountable. There's that thing where they were withholding all the evidence, exculpatory evidence about those people who hadn't committed those murders, and they all got caught out in Chicago. I think is what they were being tried for well, murder. Well, you know now. Here's a book which I, you notice I keep right at hand. It's the uh, uh, When Justice Goes Wrong and uh, How to Make It Right. It's the Innocence Project book. These are the guys that run the Innocence Project. Mm -hmm. They've now used DNA evidence to exonerate um, about 250 people who are often accused of um, rapes where there's semen around or there's other blood right. of some sort. Right. And uh, they have now found that uh, of these people they've exonerated, 25% of them actually confessed to a crime that they did. They confessed to a crime they didn't commit. And one of the questions, they have a whole chapter in this book, is why do people confess to crimes that they why? couldn't have committed? Why? And there are a number of reasons. One is the police, of course, come in and they start berating them and keep them sleepless all night. And, mm -hmm. and finally, they just want to get out of there. Mm -hmm. That's bad. Then there's the other thing is they think if you cooperate with the police and the district attorney, he'll go easier in the sentence or yeah. the charge he wants to make against you. In fact, they often will plea bargain you right outright. Conf yeah, they have that. They Let me they tell you a case I had. I was picketing across the street mm -hmm. from the United Nations building, and the president of Iran was here speaking. Mm -hmm. The police came up to me. I was standing alone with my two signs that said, Stop Hating Jews. And the policeman says, I have to move. Well, I said, No, I don't. Oh, yes, you got to move. No, I whip out my constitution. And the usual thing, show me your ID, I don't carry ID, I don't have it. Finally, they arrested me, threw me into prison. It turned out they couldn't get my fingerprints, so I was held overnight. And the next morning, I had my arraignment, and the district attorney says to me, well, before you plead, he says this to everybody, actually, nobody goes to trial, they're all plea bargains. He says, oh, I got a deal with you. He says, if you plead guilty, I'll settle for time served, which was one day, which I wasn't going to recover in any event. I said, no, I want to go to trial. <gasps> they stared at me like I was crazy. Okay. Okay. So we went on. Three days later, I get a phone call from the public defender. The district attorney has contacted her. He didn't want to contact me directly. He says that uh, he is willing to dismiss the case if I promise not to sue the police. Hmm. I said, you've got to be kidding. Yeah. No deal. Good deal, yeah. And ultimately, after a while, they just dismissed the case in the interest of justice. Yeah. But you see, so, I was an oddball in this situation. Yeah, most people just confess to things they didn't even do. Let me tell you, the there way. was one other guy at the arraignment who wouldn't plead guilty. Mm -hmm. He kept saying, this, and he said, you plead innocent. And the magistrate starts arguing with him, and the district attorney starts arguing with him. They're yelling at him, and he says, no, no, I didn't do it. I'm innocent. He kept saying it, and he wouldn't give in. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, uh, uh, a court stenographer yells out, Oh, plead guilty. You know you're guilty. Really? 
But the court stenographer yelled this out in court at that point. If it, without his permission? That's right. That's, you know, that needed to be all videoed. There needs to be videoing of these courtroom cases anyway, to show what actually goes on. There anyway, needs to be anyway, mandatory video. These are, that, that story is in my book, incidentally. Mm -hmm. anyway, That's uh, your book. You wrote that book. Not this oh, book. Okay. No, this book was written by the guys that run the Innocence Project. Okay, all right. You wrote uh, another book. Yeah, I've written the book. I have copies of them right here. It's called The Non-Trials, because in all my cases, ultimately, they throw the trials out, because uh, they don't have real cases against me. Yeah. But now, I'll tell you, there was another case in there in that day where there was a young woman. Mm -hmm. They got her. What did they do? They, uh, she was having dinner in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Cops came in, arrested mm -hmm. her, mm -hmm. strip searched her, found cocaine in her bra. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm listening. Does anybody ask if they had a search warrant? No, that doesn't occur to anybody. Okay. I mean, why would you ask such a ridiculous question? Okay, so the DA, he's going to give her a deal. She pleads guilty. He won't send her to prison. He's going to send her to a rehab for, I don't know, 30 days or 60 days or something like that. So she'll be rehabilitated. And she bursts out crying that she's a young black woman. I think black is relevant in this particular situation. I think it has an effect on it. Anyway, she says, I'm 19 years old. I'm a single mother. I don't have a job or any money. Who's going to take care of my baby? Mm -hmm. They couldn't have cared less. You see, you can ruin two lives at once. Mm -hmm. For one crime, you can get two people. Yeah. The other criminals took up a collection for her, but nobody in the courts. Nobody in the courts? Really? That's bad. Huh? That's really bad, isn't it? It's the other criminals that took up a collection yeah. for her. That shows that they're better than the people Corpse. You draw your own conclusion. Yeah, yeah. They know how bad it is to get hurt like that. Even and in the court. case of Newark, where you were there, in fact, the day that I was uh, arraigned, yeah. but you weren't there at the end, ultimately the U.S. attorney there uh, agreed to dismiss the charges against uh -huh. me. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. But when I went in for the final hearing to get my... Um, the stuff that they had stolen from me, my pamphlets and whatnot, and to, you know, read with the, in front of the judge to the court documents. They had one guy up there who uh, was about 32 years old, man, and what he was, he had been arrested for marijuana possession, mm -hmm. and he was on probation, but he had to go for a test, whatever they called him in, or once in a while, and he had missed one of the uh, times that he was supposed to be called in. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason it wasn't given, I assume he was on marijuana or something like that. Didn't know the trick about drinking tea and then you kill the test. Us marijuana guys know about how to handle those things, but apparently he didn't. Uh, or Well, I don't know. Anyway, he didn't show up. That's all we found out in court. And the judge starts laying it into him about the uh, one that. And then finally his mother, who was there, asked to speak. Forgive me, I find this trying. The mother says, My son lives with my husband and me. I'm a very sick woman. My husband is so sick that he can't move. My son has to carry him to the bathroom. I'm too frail to do it. If he goes away, my husband will have to go to a home, and I don't know what will happen to me. Yeah. 30 days, he got three people with one shot. And what did this guy do? It wasn't even that he was accused of smoking marijuana. He missed the test. Oh, and they got him. They got him. 30 days, he missed the test. Yeah. And the judge gave him a lecture about how to be a decent citizen. And I'm saying, who's lecturing who oh, here? How to be a decent citizen, yeah. This is put all this hardship on this family, and they're sick and everything like that. I think this is one of the things 
I remember hearing on Black Op Radio a lawyer talking about how damaging all these rights being taken away from people are to their lives, their ability to earn a living in America. Oh, yeah. These people are being ruined by little criminal things. I think that... So not, I mean, they're technically crimes. They're not but even crimes. there's yeah. no crime about smoking marijuana. Yeah. yeah. It may be bad. Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't do it. But, but people, there's, no there's a lot of things you shouldn't, you shouldn't be shouldn't doing. Do well, when you look at the hypocrisy and the crimes that these people are committing, and the hypocrisy and the lying they're committing about everything, the crimes of the people on the 9-11 Commission, the crimes of the people on the Warren Commission, the crimes of the Bush, Clinton, and Obama administration, they far exceed, by orders of magnitude, anything that these well, people... Well, of course, for one thing, any crime that they commit, or even if it's not a crime, any impropriety they commit, affects a large number yeah. of people. Whereas, of course, with an ordinary criminal, he's only... Yes, Maybe, in many cases, he's affecting nobody but himself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're taking drugs, you're not harming anybody else. Yeah, yeah, that's really bad. But anyhow, one thing is this. I do believe that if there were to be, I mean, to, to find out what's really going on and wrong with the criminal justice system, people need to see a visual, pictorial, video understanding of this is what happened here, and then this happened to this guy, and then this judge was totally corrupt, and these things, to see these things, and then to see that it was a court stenographer that yelled out, and the guy was connected by a court stenographer, and the effect that it had on his life. For there to be video documentation of what goes on in the courts, and then maybe to take witness testimony, these victims of these judicial miscarriages of justice, and show how it's affected their life, and then to try to come up with legislation and rules to change it so that it wouldn't be as bad as it is. That's what's necessary. Because really, I think that it's hurting just way too many people. We've got a criminal regime ruling this country. We've got a pack of liars. The hypocrisy is just unbelievable. The people who are in jail, many of them are just not even crimes that they're guilty of. And yet, who is them. ultimately to blame for this? I don't know that I belies the people. It's the system. But no. The who? It's the public. The I know what you say. You don't, we don't have to live in We can't system. change it. It's, it needs to be the, the public. You're wrong. We can change. We can if we take an active approach. And, and start we have done it water. all through history. We got rid of slavery. Yeah. We made peace with the Indian tribes. Yeah. Yeah. We got better conditions for the laboring people. Mm -hmm. We got women's suffrage. Mm -hmm. We ended the, the Jim Crow rules in right. the South. Right. We got the women's liberation movement. Okay, so what's the we're best now way the it, we're it? now moving forward in with the homosexuals. They still got a long way to go, but right. they're certainly much better off now than they were, say, 20 years ago. Right, right. And we can do it. Right. But it requires us doing it. Okay, so it requires organization of the people. It requires, it, does, it doesn't even require majority, because most of the people don't care one way or the other. It requires, Just a few I'll people. tell you what the secret is to changing the system. Yeah. I've been doing this now for 60 years. I started in high school. Okay, we've got some three minutes left. Okay. You've got to be stupid enough to think you can change the system. Okay. That's the first thing. Okay. You've got to be stupid. Okay. The second thing you've got to do is be persistent. Uh -huh. These things don't happen overnight. If you'll okay. notice all the things I mentioned, they take about 30 years. You don't convince the current generation, you convince the next while. generation. Yeah. And you see, I'll, I'm very stupid. I could give you an example, if there's time. But the most important thing is, I am the world's biggest pain in the ass. Yeah, persistence. Pain in the ass. Pain in the ass is better than persistence, yeah. That's, uh, that's persistence. Taking, taking an extra step further. Yeah. And I, when I say I, I'm using I as a plural mm -hmm. word, have changed the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've changed a number of things, didn't it? Yeah. I know what some of these things are. I got involved in 9-11 Truths, and I have had two FBI interviews as a result of that. And I went to the NIST meeting, the National Institute of Standard and Technology meeting, on February 12, 2004. Ted Gunnerson asked me if I would go, and I met Clay Picker, and had a big stack of papers that was accusing the administration of treason, and like that. I passed it out to one half of the audience. Clay passed it out to the other half of the audience. In the afternoon session, if you're going to make comments, that you had to submit your comments at least two weeks in advance. I knew that anything that I was going to say, we're just going to disallow. We don't want to hear that conspiracy theory. So I didn't submit my comments, and when the afternoon session came, I just ran right in the middle of the line. And and one day, give me the cordless microphone. I said, we've been lied to about the Kennedy assassination. We've been lied to about the Martin Luther King. We've been lied to about Tonga and Go. We're being lied to here today by you. And they grabbed the microphone. They shut off the speakers out front. Dr. Shamsundar said, no, it's not the place to talk about it now. 
Two weeks later, there was almost a car accident that would have been really a high-speed bad car accident involving three other cars. I was coming back from a ski trip with Lamont Davis out of uh, coming through the Lincoln Tunnel, the Holland Tunnel, coming back from Hunter Mountain, and it was there was a car pulled off on the median guardrail about 200 feet in front of that overpass, and I went past that about 60 miles an hour. Then, under the shadow of the overpass, on the right side, is a car pulled over and the guy's getting out and he's looking right at my car. In retrospect, the line of sight was at my license plate to see that he got the right guy. So I go past the first one and I go past him and he's got the glove compartment open, or the trunk of the car open. I just think he's got one of those buttons in the glove compartment. Then I return my gaze going forward. There's a third car stopped dead in my lane with me going 60 miles an hour. I just, it was about 250 feet ahead of me. I just barely stopped. We had cars screeching around us for maybe 30 or 40 seconds, but it seemed like three or four minutes. But if we had been hit from behind at that speed, it would have been bad. But I talked with Ted Gunderson right after it happened. He said, yeah, they were trying to kill you. He'd been run off the road many times. And he, the, it was pretty apparent with the way they did things with him. They sprayed in arsenic into his you know, condominium in Las Vegas. I sent him the prescription for the succimer for that. And they tried to kill him by running him off the road multiple times. And that was my little experience. But they, they can get pretty nasty, especially if you yeah. challenge them. But I still take that as one of my... It was the first time I was ever made to feel important. I was driving away from that like I was James Bond. I, I felt really pleased with myself. But, that, okay, that's it. We're out of time. Anything else? No. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, so, let me just put it right off there. That's it.